Thanks a lot for the very kind introduction, Lauren. Um, yeah, unfortunately, I never made it to the Olympic trials, so you know, I have to say that. Uh, yeah, so it's a great pleasure, a great honor to be here today. You know, it's fantastic to be selected among this uh, class of 2016 of the Talent at 12. Uh, the title of my presentation today is Catalytic Reaction Design, so hopefully, you know, we'll tell you a little bit about my background and a little bit about my research interest. Um, yeah, so that's the title. Uh, maybe let's uh, start with, you know, where I come from, because I'm probably the first uh, non-native, I'm obviously the first non-native uh, speaker, English speaker here on this uh, scene. And so I was born actually in Switzerland here, in the French-speaking part of Switzerland, actually in this lovely small town, nice medieval uh, uh, town in Switzerland. It's actually, as I said, in the French-speaking part of Switzerland. So this is uh, the accents that you can recognize when I speak English. Uh, then when I was around 19, 20 years old, I moved to Zurich first to learn German, but also to study at the ETH in Zurich. Maybe a little bit surprisingly to, to you in the audience, I actually studied biology, so I did bachelor and master studies in biology. But then this guy, this fantastic mentor, Eric, sort of tricked me into becoming a chemist, and an organic chemist in particular. And so I really started to enjoy thinking about methods development, and in particular about the development of catalytic reactions. And, you know, I don't want to go too much into details, but this is just showing you, you know, how impactful catalysis already is on our daily life. And so you see a few examples here from the preparation of polymers, of course, enzymatic reactions, an example of catalysis, you know, preparation of pharmaceuticals, fine chemicals, bulk chemicals, even food products. So a lot of things rely on the development of new catalytic reactions. And this was recognized early on <coughs> by Alvin Midash, who said that... Uh, Chemistry without catalysis would be a sword without a handle, a light without brilliance, a bell without sound. You know, fantastic quote from, uh, from Midash here. I've summarized a few key numbers. I don't really have time to go into details today. Probably one of the most impressive uh, numbers is to realize that a good part of the nitrogen atoms in our body actually indirectly originates from the Haber-Bosch process, which, you know, is a really fascinating fact, but also it's a little bit scary at the same time, I would argue. Uh, catalysis is also still a vibrant uh, area of fundamental research. So you can see, for example, that uh, four Nobel Prizes have been awarded in the last 15 years. So quickly, my work in Eric's lab uh, was dealing with developing catalytic reactions using diazo compounds. So diazo compounds are extremely versatile uh, reagents in organic synthesis, but unfortunately, they are highly explosive and highly toxic reagents. And so. The classical ways to use those in catalysis was to start from stable precursors under pretty harsh reaction conditions because you need to build up all that energy in these reagents. You could synthesize them and then you use them under milder conditions in the catalytic reaction. And the problem is when you have to handle those pure compounds, it's really unsafe. And so our approach during my PhD thesis was trying to identify catalyst system that would be able to perform the actual uh, catalytic reaction under the conditions necessary for the in-situ generation of this compound. So you would have a true tandem process where you would basically continuously uh, use the diazo compound that is generated in the catalytic reaction. Just one quick example of this principle that we use with diazomethane, which is sort of the prototypical diazo compound, extremely explosive, extremely toxic. And so this is the classical approach how people were doing these reactions before. They were making the diazo in a separate step, distilling it, and then using it in, in, the, in the catalytic reaction. As I mentioned, our idea was sort of to merge the two things together and identify catalysts that would survive to those pretty harsh reaction conditions and be able to do the, the catalytic transformation. And so, make a long story short, we could identify a catalyst that was tolerant to all these uh, pretty harsh uh, reaction conditions. Then in 2012, I moved to California to do my postdoc. And actually, you know, the, the probably the most challenging thing in my entire postdoc was to take the 12-hour flight with my nine-month-old daughter. Because, you know, if you've ever taken such a long flight with, with uh, young kids, it's really challenging. But anyway, we arrived safely in, uh, in Pasadena, and I had the honor to work with Bob, you know, who is one of the most exceptional uh, individuals I've met in my life, you know, working in, the, in paradise, uh, Southern California, in the middle of palm trees. So that was really exciting for, for two years. Uh, in terms of chemistry, I was actually not working on metathesis, but more on uh, oxidation chemistry as sort of a complement to alkene metathesis, because at the end of the day, you want to introduce polar groups to do some uh, downstream chemistry. So we focus on this step here, on this oxidation uh, chemistry. Just to show you one example, 
uh, we developed, you know, um, this kind of oxidation chemistry, very efficient, very general. We also understand the underlying selectivity uh, uh, effect. And so if you show just one example here of the oxidation of a bioactive compound capsaicin that is actually the active ingredient in chili peppers. So this is what makes the chili peppers really spicy, right? So next stop, after two years of postdoc, moved back to Germany, uh, actually at the Max Planck Institute for Cold Forschung. So for those of you who don't know this institute, this is where Carl Ziegler uh, discovered uh, the low pressure ethylene polymerization, you know, very important process. I mean, still nowadays, there are a few remarkable colleagues uh, of mine there, for example, Benjamin List, Alois Firstner, and Tobias Ritter. Uh, I had the pleasure to, to start a lab and, you know, grow pretty fast. And so here you see a picture taken, you know, a few months ago. And so what we're doing now, of course, we're still designing and inventing new reactions. And this is, you know, don't take this slide too seriously. These are sort of just a few guidelines, a few things that we try to keep in mind when we develop new reactions. So, of course, we would like to develop sustainable transformation. So we're usually trying to focus on the use of early, uh, on uh, first row transition metals. Of course, we want to have high selectivity in the transformation we're developing. We want to make valuable products or synthetic intermediates, either for the preparation of drugs or materials, for example. We want to be synthetically efficient, so in principle, shorten synthetic um, uh, routes. And also, we're interested in uh, new feedstocks. And so one thing we particularly enjoy doing in my lab is manipulating functional groups. And, you know, if you see here in the middle, the kind of uh, normal synthetic targets or final products you want to make, you know, do have a few functional groups, not too many, not, uh, uh, yeah, not too many. And uh, basically, so that means that if you want to make these final compounds, at some point, if you derive from, uh, if you derive them from hydrocarbon feedstocks, you will have to introduce functional groups, you know. And this is one of the things we're interested in doing. But also, you know, if you consider the growing importance of urine renewables, then you have to do the reverse. You have to remove functional groups because actually renewables tend to be over-functionalized when compared to uh, normal synthetic intermediates. And so these are two complementary approaches where you know, we're trying to, to uh, develop new reactions. We're really trying to develop tools at the end of the day. That's probably the way to summarize it. So just one quick example of introducing functional groups. Uh, Luca has developed fantastic amination reactions in my lab. I mean, a lot of people working in amination because you know a lot of bioactive compounds contain uh, amine groups. Our sort of way of thinking about this kind of transformation is we're trying to make directly the primary amine, which is at the end of the day quite often the final functional group you want to use or to have in your molecule. So Luca, a great student, could develop already uh, two transformations uh, using this principle, you know, and you can also do this transformation on fairly complex uh, molecules. Just one quick example of removing functional groups that we're doing in my lab. So Nikos, a great student from Greece, actually my very first PhD student, developed a range of transformation to selectively remove one hydroxyl group um, from, a, from a polyol derivative, you know. That could be very important in the context of using renewable um, sources of, uh, of feedstocks. More recently, could also develop a reaction where you're not only removing a hydroxyl group, but at the same time, you're rearranging the backbone, the carbon-carbon backbone of the molecule, which, you know, it's kind of a pretty exciting uh, sort of organic uh, transformation. But at that point, I, you know, I showed you how we like to introduce and remove functional groups, and, you know, I started to think if there is a way to maybe develop reactions that enable both things to be done. At, you know, not at the same time, but basically by tuning a little bit the reaction conditions, you could use a single reaction to either functionalize or defunctionalize a molecule to give you sort of unprecedented uh, synthetic uh, flexibility. And so one ideal case study that we found to develop this kind of transformation was hydrocyanation because uh, alkyl nitriles, I mean, nitriles in general are very versatile functional groups in organic synthesis. Alkenes are largely available, and so this transformation, drawn as such, is used actually industrially to make a deponitrile, a precursor to an important polymer. But the problem is that this chemistry has never been used much in the lab because it relies on using this highly toxic and, and uh, dangerous uh, HCN gas. Also, the reverse reaction that we're also interested to perform is not possible under normal reaction conditions because it's thermodynamically uphill. So we started to think about a new approach to this reaction. And so our inspiration came from transfer, hydro transfer hydrogenation. That's a very powerful reversible reaction where in principle you're able to shuttle a hydrogen molecule between two substrates without actually having to use the gas. 
So we thought that this could provide a fantastic opportunity for us to extend this concept to hydrocyanation. So instead of transferring an H2 molecule, now why not transferring an HCN molecule? And that would enable us to avoid using the actual reagent, HCN. At the same time, we could probably do the reverse reaction that we're also interested to, uh, to develop. And so this fantastic postdoc, Sanjay, coming from uh, Matthias Beller's lab, you know, worked on this project and was very rapidly, unfortunately, I don't have time to give you a lot of details, but to develop this reaction. And, what, and a big challenge that he had to solve is how to have full control over the position of the equilibrium. So you see that uh, basically we wanted to find conditions to go from one to two or the reverse go, from, go back from two to one. And so Sanjay could identify two reagents to do this chemistry. In the forward process, hydrocyanation, one of the driving force is the release of a gas. So you see that this reagent in the transfer process is transformed to a simple uh, low-boiling alkene, a gas, that is actually going to drive the equilibrium of the reaction. We could use this reaction, you know, to do, to functionalize a wide range of fairly complex-looking molecules. In the reverse process that is normally thermodynamically disfavored, one of the tricks that we use is to combine uh, the use of uh, this norbornadiene to, uh, because it's highly strained, so basically the strain release in the hydrocyanation process will drive the reaction and enable you to make a wide range of alkene derivatives. Uh, using this chemistry, for example, we could uh, functionalize the cholesterol derivative very efficiently using the nitrile group now as a removable activating group to construct uh, chemical bonds. And so where are we going now with this kind of chemistry? So as I showed you before, we managed to do this hydrocyanation chemistry that was sort of derived of hydrogenation, a transfer hydrogenation. And now we're starting to think about this in more general terms. So now we would like, we, we think that maybe there is a whole set of catalytic reactions that could proceed through this shuttle catalysis uh, uh, a sort of concept where you have a donor molecule that effectively gives a functional group to another molecule in a reversible process. And so we started to dig a little bit more seriously into literature, and we found that actually people in the past have done this kind of chemistry. So for example, Zvidon could transfer syngas, so you know, again, transferring something that is pretty hazardous, uh, carbon monoxide and, and hydrogen. Also, people have been able to transfer very reactive uh, uh, chemical entities such as uh, magnesium hydride species, you know, in a transfer hydromagnization to make new granular reagents. And also you can even think about transferring reactive intermediates such as this uh, silylene moiety that is a little bit like a, like a carbene. So we do believe that with these four examples, they really show that in principle, this general approach to catalysis could be very powerful in, you know, developing much safer and much more flexible transformation for the construction of, uh, of complex molecules. And so with that being said, I would like to, fin you know, to finish with the most important slide. So I have already a pretty, pretty large group of absolutely fantastic individuals. They're listed here. I would like to thank my colleagues from the Max Planck Institute for Colon Forschung, in particular, Professor List for continued support. And you know, last but not least, I would like to give equal contribution and congratulate and, you know, uh, really acknowledge my two fantastic mentors, uh, Eric and Bob, and probably you could see that a lot of chemistry I'm doing now is in some ways inspired by these two individuals. And of course, I would like to thank you for your attention. <laughs>